in this podcast, I will be speaking to Dr. Paul Mason. Dr. Mason, tell us about yourself. Thanks for having me here, David. So I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician in Sydney, and I have a very strong interest in metabolic medicine, and that forms a large part of my practice. Now, Paul, today we're going to actually look at um, lifestyle modification and type 2 diabetes. I think you're aware that most of the doctors and specialists would absolutely state that lifestyle modification is the cornerstone of management of all metabolic syndrome issues. However, almost in the same breath, uh, they would probably say that most patients won't be able to achieve significant and sustainable outcomes. What do you make of this? Well, it really depends on what the intervention is. If it's an evidence-based intervention, then it will invariably be successful. And if we take the most uh, important part of lifestyle medicine, it comes down to diet in terms of diabetes management. And if we have a look at some large scale trials that have been done in the US, uh, something through the Verta group, um, it's a program that's uh, premised around reduced carbohydrate diets. They're seeing diabetic remission rates in the vicinity of 50% at two years. So this is absolutely staggering. And when I describe diabetic remission, we're actually talking about normalized glycemic control, mm -hmm. um, something that is, you know, hither to now unachievable just with a pure pharmaceutical management. Yes, it almost sounds like uh, the holy grail. Well, it absolutely is. Uh, you, you have patients who no longer meet the diagnostic criteria for diabetes. And there is the argument, is it reversal of diabetes or just putting it into remission or what have you? But at the end of the day, um, we know that most all of the deleterious outcomes of diabetes relate to poor glycemic control. So if you can have normal glycemic control, then at the end of the day, that's a win for the patient. Mm -hmm. the, the nuance and the esoteric debate about whether it's reversal or remission, it doesn't really matter. It mm -hmm. means they're not suffering the diseases of diabetes. I just, before we go in depth, um, probably just mentioned that the English uh, doctor, Dr. David Unwin, has also achieved a very significant, uh, if you like, reversal or remission uh, of the order of 40%. So what's the science behind all this, Paul? Uh, what's the difference in the diet and why does it work? Well, well, I guess, first of all, we need to establish, number one, that there is science to all of this. And if we go back to last year, there was uh, the most recent meta-analysis looking at uh, very low carbohydrate diets. These are sometimes called ketogenic diets in terms of diabetic management. And they had 500 odd participants across 13 studies that they analyzed. And they had some staggering findings. Mm -hmm. So on average, they found that the fasting blood glucose levels went down by 1.29 millimoles. The average HbA1c across all of these studies went down by more than a full percentage point. The triglycerides, which we know is strongly associated with what we call atherogenic um, dyslipidemia, they went down by 0.7 and the HDL increased at the same time. And to top it off, the average participant lost 8.6 kilograms. So this is the latest level of meta-analysis level evidence on this topic. We absolutely know that these diets do work. So then the question is, how do they work? Mm -hmm. So whenever I see a patient, and I always ask them if they can explain to me what they understand about their diabetes disease. Mm -hmm. And usually they all know it's when my blood sugar is high. And they can describe to me that they've got these glucose molecules, which are then in their blood circulation, and there's just more of them than there ought be. And then I ask them a question, well, where does that blood glucose come from? And probably about half of them will say immediately, well, clearly it's from my diet, it's from what I put into my mouth. But very, very few of them actually realise that the constituent building block for carbohydrate is actually glucose. They mm -hmm. haven't had the privilege of studying biochemistry like we have in medical school. So uh, to, to us as doctors, it's just logical that if you eat a carbohydrate, irrespective of the glycemic index, fast or slow carbs, it doesn't matter. Once that's digested, it's in your circulation. Mm -hmm. And if you have a problem 
processing carbohydrate because you have uh, insulin resistance in the case of type 2 diabetes or in the case of type 1 diabetes, a deficiency of insulin, then you can't process that carbohydrate and your blood sugar will be high. So it just leads to a very logical um, conclusion that if you're a type 2 diabetic, you ought to be restricting the carbohydrates in your diet. And first and foremost, that will include sugars. Now, when we use the term sugar, that really just refers to something, uh, what we call a disaccharide in most cases, something like sucrose, which is a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule joined together. But starchy carbohydrates, what we call the farinaceous vegetables like potatoes and corn mm. and things like this, they too are made of pure glucose. Mm -hmm. And that glucose will certainly, if you're a diabetic, that will lead to a world of hurt, as you well know. Two issues here. The first is that some, many people, in fact, not some, would imagine that carbohydrates are an essential macronutrient. Mm. What do you think? Well, the premise of this um, mistaken belief actually comes around on the basis that the, the belief that carbohydrates are essential for metabolism of the brain. So we know that the brain can metabolize glucose. And we also know that some cells in the body, such as the red blood cells, our erythrocytes have an obligate need for glucose. But the simple fact is, there's two things that counter this. So the Glucose that the body needs to function, it can make. So we have a process called gluconeogenesis, which is performed within the liver. And gluconeogenesis can use either protein, certain specific amino acids, or glycerol, which is uh, part of the triglyceride fat. So we can literally break down fat to produce glucose if we need to. So the need of glucose in the body can be met by non-carbohydrate sources. Mm -hmm. And what people also don't realize is that the brain has an amazing capacity to use ketones, which can be a byproduct of fat metabolism for energy. Um, that the absolute need for glucose metabolism in the brain in the setting of sufficient ketones is actually very, very low. And I'll just, I'll just take a little bit of a tangent here to describe how interesting this belief is. And, and it is well recognized now, I believe the Institute of um, Medicine in the United States now recognizes that carbohydrates are not an essential nutrient. Um, but somehow we've put carbohydrates up on a pedestal as something that's necessary for brain function. And I'll just ask if we're having a look at the developing brain, um, well, that 60% of the brain is actually made of fat, 25% of which is cholesterol. And for the brain to actually be built, the, the, it's actually constituted of ketone bodies that have crossed the blood-brain barrier because they're water-soluble and then are able to be converted into the fats that form the structure of the brain. So for developing brains in children and infants, it's actually, we know that they're, they're basically born into ketosis, bread fed infants are in a strong state of ketosis and children by their metabolisms will enter ketosis far more readily mm -hmm. than will adults. And this is only natural and desirable because this actually allows the part of the brain to be formed. So it, it's quite interesting if we're actually looking at whether for optimal bone, uh, brain health, it would be desirable to be on a carbohydrate fed diet, say rice cereals and things like that, or perhaps an animal based diet that might be more supportive of ketosis. Uh, if you actually have a look at the biochemistry of it, the diet in ketosis is far likely to support brain development. Yes, and I, I think it's actually really important, Paul, that you make the point that a breastfed child is essentially in ketosis. Oh, it, it absolutely is. So, you know, in the vicinity of 50% of the energy in breast milk can come from saturated fats. Um, so this is, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, it's obviously got carbohydrate in it, it's obviously got protein in it, but it's got a lot of fat in it as well. So let, let, let me segue back to the sugars, because I think it's very important. You, you have mentioned that uh, as doctors, we have been taught and, and we know that carbohydrates is glucose and patients 
might not have understood it, but take us from there. Uh, patients now understand that their blood sugar level is high. And yes, oh, okay, it's coming from carbohydrates. Oh, shock, horror. So where do you go from there? Well, I mean, it really, if you've already got a patient who is a diabetic, it's very easy because they often have access to continuous glucose monitors. There's a fantastic product on the market now called a Freestyle Libra. It's basically a small needle. It's the size of a 20 cent piece. It sticks onto the back of your arm here um, and it samples the interstitial fluid. And it's about a five minute delay behind the, uh, the blood glucose, but it gives you a real time trace 24 seven. So it communicates using near field connectivity with your mobile phone or the patient's mobile phone. So they can get a real time readout and each sensor costs $95. So it's not inexpensive. It lasts for two weeks. They can get a real time readout on exactly what their blood sugar is doing. And of course, as a clinician, I'm most interested in postprandial rises because that's what they've got most control of. And that's an amazing education tool. Mm -hmm. If you educate a patient and saying, look, your sugar went to 14 here, you thought this meal of rice was healthy. Well, it's not healthy. You're, you're exceeding the renal reabsorption threshold here. And you thought your breakfast of porridge was good for you. Well, look, your blood sugar was 16. And you say, well, and here you had you had salmon or you had a steak and you can barely even tell that you consumed a meal at that point in time. So in the last few years, this has absolutely revolutionized my practice because it's given patients far more meaningful feedback. And I mean, as doctors, we always want the capacity to help our patients. And before we had continuous glucose meters, we relied on patients trusting us. And as you know, they don't always trust what we say, but if they can see it with their own eyes, um, there's no denying that. Mm. Now, let's just say now that patient X is convinced that, um, gee, I, I, I can know every time I have that porridge or that those bread rolls, uh, my sugar spikes. Where do you take them next, Paul? Well, it's really then we recommend they go on a healthy diet. Um, I, I guess one of the big concerns here is that my perception of a healthy diet is what you could probably call at odds with the food pyramid, which we've all grown up with and which is now morphed into the, the healthy plates. Um, because still we have this, this paradigm that saturated fat is somehow deleterious for our health and that polyunsaturated fats and seed oils are good for our health. Now, I'd like to preface this to state that the Journal of the American Academy of Cardiologists um, put out a position um, piece uh, in, I think it was September of 2020, where they actually formulate the opinion that there is no reason at all to exclude um, foods rich in saturated fats from the diet, which includes dairy, meat, and eggs. They've done a complete about turn. And I believe that three of the authors on this uh, opinion piece of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology were previously responsible for the drafting of a previous iteration of the American Dietary Guidelines. So you can really see um, the degree of about turn that's been done. But let's talk about, so if that, that's the end point, it, it looks like now there is overwhelming evidence. So for instance, last year, there was an umbrella review published and an umbrella review is a review of all the meta-analyses because there's been so many meta-analyses and systematic reviews done on this topic. This umbrella review looked at 17 of them and it came to the firm conclusion that saturated fats should not be avoided that they indeed are healthy. And to understand how, I guess, as doctors, we've been, uh, I guess, uh, ignorant to this message for so long as I was. So in medical school, I remember we learning about the Women's Health Initiative and all of this, and we were absolutely convinced that saturated fats were the devil, that if you have too many saturated fats, that was your way to an early grave. Um, but the original research, if we go way back to 1966, they did something called the Sydney Diet Heart Study, where they had Australian males who had had heart attacks, and they placed them on what they considered was a prudent diet. They re reduced their saturated fats in their diet and replaced it with seed oils, with vegetable oils, polyunsaturated oils. 
And the interesting thing is that the, um, the data on mortality and all-cause mortality was never published. Mm. And it was only when a researcher by the names of Christopher Ramsden actually came across the study data in a basement. He went to um, try and find the original researchers and he found one of the children of the original researchers and he said, oh, yeah, I think Dad's got his files in the basement there. And they managed to, uh, and they were on punch cards and magnetic tapes and stuff like that. So it wasn't easy, but they managed to decode them all and they were able to cross-reference all the findings and validate them. And they were able to actually um, get the data in a state where it was actually published in the British Medical Journal. And the conclusion was that those males who were randomised to the polyunsaturated fat diet had a statistically significant increase in mortality of 62%. This is absolutely huge. And the Minnesota coronary experiment of about the same era, I think uh, finished in 1973, um, that I think that was on about 9,000 um, males and females who were in institutions. So they were able to control their diets in ways that um, research just could never be done now. And they found the same thing, that, uh, that the more you were lowered somebody's cholesterol with diet, the higher you had increased their risk of dying. And again, this study, I think it wasn't published a couple of years after the Sydney Diet Heart Study. The final study findings were published in 2016, again, in the British Medical Journal. And then if we have a look at the Women's Health Initiative study, so this is about 50,000 females, cost us 700 million US dollars, um, the world's most expensive dietary intervention study to the best of my knowledge. And when we read the original paper and you read the tape, the conclusion and the results section and you listen to, you read the discussion and listen to the press conferences, uh, it seems to be in support of a low fat diet, except it showed nothing of the sort. There was only one statistically significant finding from that whole study. And that was buried on page 661 of the original publication. And it wasn't in the results table. It was a line of obscure text along the lines of, say, the HR for those with pre-existing CVD was 1.26, full stop. And unless you, you took in the whole context of what it was actually saying, it said that those females with heart disease um, who entered the study and were randomised to a low fat diet or a reduced fat diet, they had a 26% mm. increased risk mm. of cardiac complications, presumably including death, but not explicitly stated. And more recently, um, uh, Professor Timothy Noakes has just published in Open Heart, the British Medical Journal um, offshoot, um, a complete analysis of the later data from the Women's Health Initiative. And it looks like that the longer that those females adhere to the low fat diet, that there's a dose effect on the severity of those deleterious outcomes. Mm -hmm. It actually looks like the magnitude of these cardiac issues and presumably all cause mortality actually gets worse with time. So it's really fascinating how as doctors, we've, we've been indoctrinated almost mm. And I don't use that word lightly to fear saturated fat. And I'm certainly guilty of telling many patients, oh, don't eat that, eat this, eat that, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and it was in complete contradiction to the evidence. And the simple fact is the dietary guidelines have not caught up. Uh, and I'm very comfortable saying that because I've got an enormous amount of research that shows that uh, the dietary guidelines were not evidence-based when they were introduced. And despite undergoing several iterations, they are still not evidence-based today. The balance of evidence is that saturated fat is healthy and that polyunsaturated and seed oil fat and seed oil consumption, um, well, I, I will have to um, preface this saying, is that the polyunsaturated consumption in the form of oils appears to be deleterious. Um, I personally believe that polyunsaturated fats contained within whole foods 
are not deleterious at all. And that's explained by the oxidation tendency of these fats. So the thing that renders them liquid at room temperature is a double bond between the carbons. And polyunsaturated fat just simply means they've got more than one of these carbon bonds, but they're very reactive bonds mm. and they're prone to oxidation rapidly. And when you put them in a bottle and leave it in the bottle for weeks or months or even years, um, there is an incredible amount of oxidation. And we've actually got very good research that these oxidation products get absorbed and they lead to oxidized LDL particles. So we can actually, in animal models, we've done electron microscopy and we can visualize mm. um, the development of um, fatty liver disease in response to consumption of these oxidized oils. We really know they're not very good. But if you're consuming fresh food that contains polyunsaturated fat, the very definition of rancidity is lipid peroxidation. So if you're not eating food that's rotten, then the polyunsaturated fats you're eating are non-oxidized. Mm. So that's why I make that distinction between polyunsaturated fats from an oil source and understand that they are, you know, they deodorize them, they, they try and put, you know, they, they process, process them in a way that is unnatural and makes us uh, unaware of how oxidized it is. But if you had a rotten fish in front of you, you wouldn't need it. Mm. What a very good point. Now, Paul, I just want to go back and make two comments. Uh, the one is about meat and saturated fats. I mean, don't they ever consider that meat also has quite a bit of mono unsaturated fats? It's, 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 it's such a skewed discussion when it comes to meat uh, that I'm not sure that many people actually have a very, if you like, balanced approach to talking about fat in meat. In well, let's just talk way. about this scaremongering of red meat for a while. So this is something that uh, I was a little bit confused about. Um, we hear that, you know, the biggest criticism labelled against red meat, so if we accept that saturated fat is okay, we can move on from that side. But then we also hear red meat causes bowel cancer, colorectal cancer. So... I went having a look at the research and I spoke to my good friend, Dr. Georgia Eads. So she's a, um, a physician in America. And uh, what has transpired is that this World Health Organization report that's kickstarted it all, I think it was in 2016, this mm -hmm. whole um, this report that said red meat probably causes colorectal cancer, the actual evidence in that report was severely lacking. So they were supported by six references, six references. Now, well, that's six experimental studies, sorry. So 20 references in total, 14 of which were epidemiological studies. Mm -hmm. They also cited 15 epidemiological studies within that paper that didn't find any connection between red meat and colorectal cancer. So even on the epidemiological evidence, they had more papers that found against it. And this is in the setting that there's been over 800 epidemiological studies done on the connections between red meat and cancer. So of those 800 studies, they selected 29 epidemiological studies, only 14 of which had an effect. So you really have to wonder whether there's cherry picking there. And then we come to the six experimental studies, because as you know, epidemiology cannot prove causation. Mm. It's fundamentally limited and it's academically disingenuous to pretend that that can demonstrate red meat being problematic in terms of cancer. It can mm -hmm. only show an association. So these experimental studies become really important. So three of these studies used rodents. They injected the rodents with carcinogens, then they fed them red meat, and then they concluded that red meat causes cancer. Now, you, this sounds utterly ridiculous. You're thinking he's making that up. I encourage everybody who's listening to this to please go to the original World Health Organization report and look at the references. You'll see of the six experimental studies cited, three of them had this structure. The other three all had fundamental limitations. They used outcomes, surrogate markers for cancer, which some of which have been totally discredited, um, totally irrelevant. They just don't show that. They, uh, some of them, uh, the, the interventions were not pure. 
So they had people drinking sugar sweetened beverages, you know, something which we know increases the risk of cancer at the same time as having red meat and saying that that increases the changes associated with bowel cancer. Well, that's not a pure intervention. They mm. had small sample sizes. So every one of these other three studies had significant methodological limitations. So this whole, I find it quite interesting that we can have drawn such strong conclusions against red meat based on what can only be described as flimsy evidence. Dr. Mason, you've really taken us for a inter very interesting ride. So we've got three macronutrients. And what you've told us so far is that the two that we are most afraid of, which is fats and too much protein, are in fact probably demonized with very little evidence. And the one that has been held up on the pedestal as the food to eat most of, in fact, is the big, big uh, is the problem. In a nutshell, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I probably haven't talked enough about protein. Um, I think protein is really undervalued uh, in our society. And one of the, I guess, to make a, an adjunct point to that, we often talk about meat or foods like this as being a protein. And I really think that's the, we shouldn't be thinking about it as a protein because foods like red meat are the most nutrient dense foods we have. And whenever you see protein in a natural food, it's invariably associated with a heck of a lot of other nutrients. And if we're looking at eating healthy diets and living healthily, it's all about getting enough nutrition into our body. And so these kind of foods should be desirable, not only for their protein content, but also for their micronutrients, for the zinc, for the selenium, for the carnosine, for the carnitine, for the taurine, for the complete blend of amino acids, which we don't have within plant foods. Um, so number one, yes, protein is wonderful. And I really think that um, uh, our, the body's needs for protein is severely underestimated with the RDA. So I'll tell you how they form the RDAs for protein. So the current dietary guidelines in Australia recommend about 0.8 grams per kilogram per body weight per day for adult males and females. And this data was based on the role of protein as a structural substrate. So in other words, as the building block for tissues, for muscles and things like this. But we know that proteins serve an important role in our body as enzymes. And if we only look at nitrogen balance studies um, in young, healthy males, and these were the studies that were done without malabsorption problems, without different needs across their lifespan, and we discount the role of proteins as um, important enzymatic catalysts and the like, then we severely underestimate what is needed for optimal health. I'll give you an example of the consequences of overlooking this. So if you have an average patient go to a GP, let's say she's 50 years old, she's fallen down and she's got a Collis fracture, fall onto an outstretched hand. She has a DEXA scan, she's shown to be osteoporotic. Standard management then would probably begin with something like a bisphosphonate therapy. And then maybe then we could talk about the fancier things like denizumab and things like that. And we would not have any conversation about whether it's possible to reverse the osteoporosis with diet. Simply, I recall being taught um, back in the 90s that your bone mineral density peaked at ages 20 to 30, and yep. it was absolutely impossible to ever increase it from there. That's what I was taught. In 2002, there was a study that was done by a couple of uh, very clever researchers, and they were looking at uh, nutrition, they were looking at calcium and vitamin D, and they were seeing if that had the capacity um, to reverse osteoporosis. And they did six monthly DEXA scans over a period of three years. And then they did something particularly clever. They stratified the study population based on tertiole of protein intake. Mm -hmm. Because we think about bone being made of calcium, but it's not. It's made of a protein structure that provides a scaffolding. And then within that scaffolding, we contain the hydroxyapatite crystals and the phosphate and the calcium and all of these mm -hmm. other things. But it's the protein structure that underlines it. 
basically we can think about bone being like a mineralized tendon. Mm -hmm. So if we, we can reduce the breakdown of bone by giving calcium, because a lot of the reason we break down bone is because we're deficient in calcium. So we'll break down the bone to get at that calcium and release it. But if we need to build more bone, if we just throw calcium at the problem, we, we don't, we're not providing the structure for the protein. It's like trying to bake a cake with only one ingredient. You're missing something. Mm. When they stratified this study population, and this population was um, males and females over the age, I think it was 65. So postmenopausal females and elderly males. And they found that those subjects who were having the highest amount of protein in their diet wasn't particularly high. They were just in the top tertile. Over the course of three years, they were able to have proven reversal of osteoporosis in their femoral neck. And if you've ever seen a patient with a, uh, a hip fracture, you know how significant that mm -hmm. is. This was a solely nutritional intervention in the highest risk population with no drugs at all, proven reversal of osteoporosis. And the key to this was the protein and understanding that, uh, and it really just illustrates my point, protein is undervalued as a nutrient. And I think if we're recommending patients have 0 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, especially the elderly, we're missing a trick. Uh, I really, at least in my patients, I would like to see them having at least double that. And for reassurance, when we have a look at the data mm. on whether you know, we worry about what it does to the, the kidneys, mm. the, the data shows, if anything, there was a recent paper out that was done by the, um, our colleague who you just mentioned before, Dr. David Unwin, um, looking at the reduced carbohydrate diet experience with chronic kidney disease, having higher protein intake, it actually found kidney function improved. So yes. there's really no evidence. And in short-term studies, we've even got bodybuilders who have ridiculous amounts, you know, things uh, in excess of five grams per kilogram per day. And I've even heard up to nine grams per kilogram per day, silly amounts of protein. If you don't, there's been no documented cases of kidney problems secondary to that. So at the very least, we've got medium-term data going up to about four grams per kilogram per day. So, you know, if you're telling somebody to have one or two grams of protein per kilogram per day, there's no realistic concern. And logically speaking, if we're worried, we, we often determine that um, oh, we assess kidney function by looking for a proteinuria, so microalbumin to creatinine ratio or something like that, because we know when the kidneys are dysfunctional, they lose protein. And it seems that our knee-jerk reaction has been, well, um, higher protein in the urine must be bad. So if I restrict protein from the diet, I might be able to reduce the amount of protein in the urine and that might be better. But logically speaking, if the patient's losing more protein, wouldn't it make more sense to give them more protein, especially if there's no evidence that it's damaging to the kidneys and there's not. Dr. Mason, I really love the way you approach this protein issue because you've managed to touch on every single thing that many of us worry about. Colorectal cancer, bad for the kidneys, we really don't need that much and really love those studies about osteoporosis and, and, and protein, fabulous studies. I need a comment from you. Whenever I talk about foods that are rich in nutrients, it's amazing the number would say fruits and vegetables. It's amazing. Well, I mean, this is very simple. Let's just do a thought experiment. If you were only to eat plant foods and to not supplement it for 10 years, what would happen? Well, I, I guess people do survive. Uh, there's a degree of suffering. Well, you, you would become vitamin B12 deficient. Yep. Um, you'd probably become iron deficient because the reality is it doesn't matter how much spinach you have, the non-heme iron is not, bio, not very bioavailable. Essentially, at best, you would survive, but you certainly would not thrive. If you were to have a diet purely of animal foods for 10 years, what would happen to your health? Absolutely nothing. And this is incredibly surprising to people. Um, people don't realise that, and this is, there are people out there, I kid you not, who consume only a red meat diet. They're called carnivores. And there's cases of carnivores in America who have been doing it for over 30 years. And indeed, we've got ancestral populations who consume animal foods for long periods of time, like the Maasai. Mm. 
So, and they, you know, they either eat beef and drink milk and that's it in their diet and they don't suffer from any nutritional deficiency. And the most common question I get about nutritional deficiencies is what about vitamin C? And this is a really interesting one. So when I went looking into it a couple of years ago, um, the first thing that struck me was on a low carbohydrate diet, the, ne the need for vitamin C is less. Vitamin C competes with sugar for absorption. So when you're having less glucose in the diet, um, you're not having that competitive inhibition of your vitamin C absorption. Number two, the recommended daily intake for vitamin C was set relatively higher than was uh, indicated by the evidence because it was thought that it was an antioxidant and that would be good for you. So we'll just encourage people to have more. And number three, despite common belief, meat actually does have vitamin C in it. So, and this is another case of where science is a little bit misleading. If you go back to some old books and you have a look at the tables of nutrients contained within meat, and I've seen examples of this, you'll see it'll have vitamin C, it'll have a zero with a little asterisk. And, okay, what's the asterisk mean? And you go down and have a look at the bottom of the page and it says presumed to be zero. So yeah. a lot of those references assume that there wasn't any vitamin C in meat, so they didn't bother to measure it. The simple fact is it's there and it's well known that it can both cure and prevent scurvy. So the explorers in the Antarctic used to eat penguins to manage their scurvy. Um, soldiers in the Napoleonic era, they used to, if they developed scurvy, they used to be fed raw horse meat from horses that had died in battle and that would cure their scurvy. So this has been long, well known for a long period of time. And with regards to the sailors, the problem was that they weren't, uh, you know, they were often on a diet after many, many months of dried biscuits and things like that. They certainly weren't getting any mm. meat in their diets there when on those long voyages. Um, so sure, you can get it from, from uh, plant foods, but it will be very surprising for people to know that there is actually vitamin C in meat. And there are, as I said, uh, as crazy as it sounds, there are these people who sustain themselves entirely on a meat-based diet um, in perfectly good health with, uh, with no documented deficiency. Thank you for really putting it there, that um, meat and protein, a whole meat, is, is certainly a whole meal, It's uh, if you like, a whole meal, uh, and that uh, long-term ingestion leads to no health issues. But there's a lot of issues with um, people consuming a pure plant diet where they need to supplement. Paul, I need to just bring you to us a conversion towards the end now, because you've taken us on a really important journey. And I want you to now um, make some of your own comments, but I'll just preface that by saying that what you are actually talking about, which is a low carb approach to the management of diabetes, it's not fringe, it's not snake oil. Uh, we've seen the CSRO have their own low carb study for, in Australia for patients with diabetes and various organizations, uh, diabetes organizations around the world have endorsed uh, a low carb approach. So I, I think I need you to just give us an idea very, very briefly, what is it, what, where do they go to? And then I would also love a very quick comment on small dense LDL, because I think this is something that most GPs don't know about. Well, I, I think perhaps I might address the cholesterol question first, if you don't mind, David. Please do. So uh, this is incredibly important because um, while we know the adherence to ketogenic diets is far and above better than adherence to low fat diets, and we've got some fantastic research and we know why, because it, it satiates hunger, people eat to appetite. So in one uh, survey, I think it was the Journal of Insulin Resistance that was published in, um, they found that before they went on a low carb diet, um, almost 90% of people had severe hunger issues in between meals. And on a, a reduced carbohydrate diet, that reduced to 3.5% of people experiencing any hunger before meals. So we know that this satiety actually enhances compliance. So the question is, um, you know, is there anything else that in affects compliance? Um, and one of the strongest factors is healthcare professionals who express concern about somebody's 
potential cholesterol or actual cholesterol changes on increasing the saturated fats in their diet. So I think we need to probably address a couple of questions. So we've now moved on from this concept that total cholesterol or indeed even total LDL is a meaningful marker in isolation of cardiovascular risk. Um, so the question about LDL is one that will probably surprise people, but we've now got um, very good evidence and one systematic review of prospective studies looking at LDL levels that included 11 studies. And that basically found that there was a dose dependent relationship between higher LDL levels and increased longevity. Basically it found that for all quartiles of LDL levels, the risk of death was lower the higher it went. And that was a consistent finding across all of the studies that were done. Um, and again, this is, uh, this is not fringe research. This was published in the British Medical Journal. So the best level of evidence we have demonstrates increased longevity with higher LDL levels. So that's not something we need concern ourselves about in isolation. However, not all LDL is good and LDL can be damaged. And this can occur um, through both glycation, which is sugar attachment or oxidation. So we call it glyco-oxidative damage. And in that situation, it, it's a little bit complex, but the, the natural physiology of cholesterol, if you uh, bear with me, is we have the liver and that makes something called VLDL, very low dense LDL. And this is full of triglycerides and cholesterol both important structures for the body. And the job of this VLDL molecule that's produced by the liver is to deliver its cargo around the body. And as it delivers its cargo, it obviously gets a little bit smaller. And when it gets small enough, we arbitrarily give it a name change from VLDL to IDL, intermediate density lipoprotein, but it's still the same particle. And then when it drops off a little bit more cargo on its travels around the body, it becomes a low density lipoprotein or an LDL. So it's the very same particle. And then you've got a receptor on the liver, we call it an LDL receptor, that this LDL receptor will bind to and take it back out of circulation. And this LDL that's able to do this is perfectly healthy and has no connection with atherosclerosis at all. However, if that LDL particle gets damaged, then what actually happens is its ability to bind to the LDL receptor becomes affected. Um, so it can't leave the circulation and do what it normally does and it will instead accumulate. And it will then get taken up by macrophages. So it's a very interesting theory. It looks like the best evidence we have at the moment is that it doesn't enter the intima of the arteries uh, internally. We used to think it was actually the endothelial cells, the vascular endothelium that was separating, but it looks like it enters it from the outside through something called the vasa vasorum, the blood supply to the blood vessels. Um, and we know this because when we look at um, the histology of it, we see the concentration gradient is actually going from the outside in, not from the inside out. So that, that gives us a little bit of uh, information about the directionality of it. And we see that these deposits are happening where you have most of the vasa vasorum. Um, so what ends up happening is that these LDL particles will make their way into the intima and be taken up by macrophages through something called the scavenger receptor. And that is the principle of atherosclerosis. It's not LDL particles that can be taken up by the liver that ends up in the blood vessels. It's damaged LDL. And in the process of being damaged, they undergo a fractional shrinkage. So we use the term small dense LDL. And this is what we term atherogenic dyslipidemia. So we can actually do special blood tests now. We do in Australia most commonly called lipid electrophoresis, where we actually place a sample of the LDL uh, into a gel and pass an electrical current. And then the LDL gets spread out based on its density and the charge. And because this, uh, the oxidized LDL is smaller, we can actually see it travels down further into the gel and we can see the peaks.
And if we see, we can often see in the really bad cases up to five distinct peaks representing five distinct populations of LDL. In a truly healthy person, you should only have one population of LDL. So this is uh, direct evidence. It's called lipid electrophoresis. You just order a lipid subfraction test. And that is incredibly revealing about somebody's current state of metabolic health based on their LDL. So not all LDL is good on average higher LDL levels are better, but it's in my mind, it's still worthwhile assessing uh, the LDL population itself in some high risk cases to see whether it's this atherogenic LDL or not. And a shortcut way of determining whether the LDL is likely to be good or not is something we call the triglyceride to HDL ratio. So we know that triglycerides, which are produced um, within the liver um, de novo lipogenesis is actually associated with poor metabolic health. So if you have a higher level of triglycerides and a lower HDL, um, that would indicate that you have an unfavorable um, lipid profile and your LDL is therefore more likely to be this higher risk of LDL. So it, it's not a simple subject, but it is an important subject because this knee-jerk reaction that we say, oh, your LDL's gone up, you have to stop this diet or you're going you're gonna to drop dead. It's simply, it's premature to make those comments unless you've done the investigation and established it for a fact. And in most cases, because these people, they're losing weight, their sugar control is better, they're not having oxidized seed oils, they're not having sugars anymore, they're often, you know, as part of their whole lifestyle changing, they're sleeping better, they're exercising more, they are healthier people. And it's absolutely the wrong message to give them to tell them that they're actually harming their health. And they often come to me and they say, I don't understand it, I feel better than I've ever felt. And I'm at risk of dropping dead. And I I think you'll appreciate the irony in that. So in... Quick, quick uh, point. You mentioned the triglyceride HDL ratios. Just give us a couple of numbers that we should be looking out for. Oh, look, it really depends on, well, Australian units. Um, rather than the ratio, I really like my triglycerides to be under one. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that people on strong ketogenic diets should reliably be able to get them under 0 0.8. Mm -hmm. With regards to HDL, the data would indicate that it ideally would be 1.5 or greater. And I frequently see it in people who have been on a long-term healthy diet over two, easily over two, often outside the reference range. And that includes for males as well. Thank you for that. Now, I guess um, we're coming back to the end of the uh, podcast now, Paul. Uh, so I, think I did ask you a question about um, summing up the low carb diet. Uh, and you were just going to very quickly touch on ketosis before we get some key points from you. Right. Well, ketosis, look, understand that ketosis is not the same as ketoacidosis. So that's a big fear that a lot of us have. And this was drummed into us at medical school, probably because we didn't get enough instruction on what the difference is. So ketosis is simply the state of producing ketones um, every day. Um, we call it nutritional ketosis. The level of ketones that you produce in nutritional ketosis is far below the threshold which would be required to upset the pH that could lead to a ketoacidosis. So just for reference, the uh, most people um, on a ketogenic style diet, a low carbohydrate diet, they will be lucky to get ketones of 0.3 to 0.5 millimoles a litre. Um, most cases of ketoacidosis will be in the vicinity of 10 to 20 millimoles a litre. So you can see that there's an order of magnitude difference. Just detecting ketones on a urinary dipstick or detecting ketones in somebody's blood does not mean that they are in ketoacidosis. As you know, the human body has some fabulous capacities to buffer these. So we've got our kidneys that can manipulate our bicarbonate excretion. We've got our respiration, which we just increase our respiration slightly. We can breathe out more carbon dioxide and we can offset you know, a, a slight increase in acid that way. Um, we've got some remarkable compensatory abilities there. Really, probably the only thing I would urge people is that if you have a patient who's on a, a class of medication called an SGLT2 inhibitor, 
then there have been um, documented cases of what we call euglycemic ketoacidosis in those patients. That's not a normal state. That's a function of the medication that they're taking. And those patients should either cease the drug or they should not be on a ketogenic diet. Um, well, I, I think that's a very important point. And I just want to add that apart from the ketone levels being low, uh, we got to look at the sugar levels as well, because in nutritional ketosis, you've got normal blood sugar levels. And that's not the same with ketoacidosis. Well, it's actually interesting that you say that you've got normal sugar levels or even low sugar levels, because what actually happens if the body is able to metabolize ketones for energy, it doesn't need as much sugar. So the, the gluconeogenesis might be a little bit downregulated. Um, I'll give you an example. There was a starvation study done by a chap called Cahill, George Cahill, I think it was. And they starved some subjects for 40 days. It was a pure water fast. And at the end of 40 days, and this is in the days before institutional review boards, um, they said, what happens if we inject them with a bunch of insulin? Um, so I've got this in my head, I've got this graph. You see this glucose traveling along, it might've been at three or something like that, maybe two and a half, pretty low, and it goes down to one. And you also see their beta hydroxybutyrate level, the ketone body, that levels at that same point in time, that dropped precipitously as well. And the subjects with a blood glucose of one, completely asymptomatic. So what's actually happened is that as soon as you take that sugar out of their circulation, the brain was able to just jump on and use those ketones instead. And that's, that explains the drop in ketones at the same time. It wasn't because of the insulin injection. Insulin doesn't do that. It just meant that once you took the sugar out of the equation, it meant that the body started metabolizing more ketone bodies. Interesting study. Paul, uh, would you like to now just go back and give us some key messages? Look, I think as, as doctors, patients trust us. And I guess uh, don't abuse that trust and give misinformation. Um, knowingly or not knowingly, I feel quite guilty about what I did for um, over a number of years, um, I'm still doing penance, I think, and that's why I'm on your podcast now, <laughs> trying to right the wrongs of what I've done in the past. Um, but saturated fat is not the devil. The evidence that red meat causes cancer is equivocal at best. Um, high LDL level does not necessarily mean that you're headed to an early grave. On average, it would be associated with longevity. And if you are worried about it, we have some more advanced testing. You can do an LDL subfraction or you can do a triglyceride to HDL ratio. The patient must understand that in diabetes, the problem is secondary to too much glucose in the bloodstream and that glucose comes from the diet. Once they have that link, and if you give them advice to then go and purchase a user continuous glucose monitor for two weeks, they will get real-time feedback. It's, it's all about accountability. It's a lie detector for them. And as a doctor, I ask them to give me their phone when they come in and I know I'll look up their app and I have a look at their traces and it keeps the patients accountable. And we're, in our modern societies, it's not easy to forego sugar. Um, we've got people pressuring you. You say, oh, just have one, it won't kill you. Um, you've got the advertising, you buy petrol and you've got a row full of candy bars in front of you. So every tool that we can give our patients to assist them will make it that little bit easier. So the continuous glucose monitor is an incredible tool and I think it's heavily underutilised. Dr Mason, I really appreciate your time, but also the way you teach. I think this is a very important podcast uh, for all our listeners. Well, it's been a pleasure to be on. I'm really grateful that you invited me on. So thank you. Thank you. Paul, I'll just take it off the record uh, now. Uh, but